Hello, my name is Douglas Gabriel. Today I'm going to be talking about a most incredible being named Ralph Marinelli, one of the most amazing people I ever met. And the reason he's famous is because if you Google the heart is not a pump, Ralph Marinelli's name will come up. And the research that he did that is now accepted in all the best cardi cardiologists believe that what Ralph pointed out is true. The heart is not a pump. The old idea from Harvey, 350 year old idea was basically laid aside once Ralph proved that the heart is in fact a biological momentum vortex booster and that it's part of a circulation system and it can't be considered by itself. Now this might seem very simple of a concept, but it isn't because if you believe that the heart is in fact a mechanical pump, then you also believe the human being is probably somewhat mechanical. And then what is a human being? So the question I'm going to talk about today is going to be looked at from a few perspectives. First, this audio is going to reach many anthroposophists, people who study the work of Dr. Rudolf Steiner, who passed away back in 1925, but was the founder of the Waldorf movement and had incredible ideas about everything. And Ralph Marinelli was a person who studied his work, and that work is called Anthroposophy. And Waldorf Education came out of that work of Rudolf Steiner's. So I'm going to tell you a story about how it was that my interactions with Ralph Marinelli came to be, and how it was that I had a very peripheral part to do with that entire scenario that has now truly transplanted an old idea and brought a new living idea about the heart into modern science. So here goes. I was a Waldorf teacher and I taught at the Detroit Waldorf School for many years and that school was founded by Ralph Marinelli and his wife Phyllis as well as another man who was Dr. Rudy Wilhelm and his wife Amelia Wilhelm. They had heard a lecture by Herman von Barvalli in Detroit at the Central Methodist Church, and they became so inspired because they were both, um, all of them were students of Rudolf Steiner, and they became inspired by this idea of having a school that was a foundation built upon anthroposophy, built upon the work of Rudolf Steiner. And so they got very excited. Dr. Wilhelm was a very wealthy, and um, he was an allergen allergy doctor, and Ralph was a retired U.S. Army engineer. Now, that in itself is an amazing thing. Ralph had a laboratory that sometimes had 125 people working in it, many of them engineers, and they were basically working on things that had failed in the Army and any kind of equipment whatsoever, from uh, uh, tanks to screws, you name it, he dealt with it. And he had people working on amazing things all the time. So it was not really a research and development center as much as it was a laboratory to try to fix stuff. And he directed all of them. And he says that, you know, it was just so much fun. And Ralph was the most amazingly um, jubilant person, filled with levity, humor. He was like a comedian, but he didn't try to be a comedian. He just was such a genius that he found everything to be funny all the time. So if you were talking to Ralph, you were laughing. That's just the way it was, unless it was a very deep, serious matter. So this is a guy who experimented hands-on with everything. And he said, it didn't matter to him. You know, he'd put up these walls because he'd let his engineers try things until they'd explode. And, you know, it wasn't a normal day there unless there was an explosion. So that's Ralph. Ralph was this retired, amazing guy, but he was a hands-on guy. And here he is founding this spiritual school. And it was the Detroit Waldorf School, which basically was a one of the most beautiful schools in Detroit. It was built for the rich people in Indian Village, they called it. This exclusive area where the Dodges and the Fords and all of the um, big auto magnets live there. And they sent their children to the school called the Liggett School. And then when Dr. Wilhelm and... Uh, Ralph, Ralph actually found this building and it was very inexpensive, so they bought it and then they invited some people to come there to start the Waldorf School. Now, I know this is a long story, but you have to understand this to understand Ralph. So Ralph uh, threw himself into repairing this building and making it beautiful and doing amazing things and inventing things to just help the boilers work or inventing things to correct problems in the foundation of the building. You name it, Ralph could actually fix it. 
And the bigger the problem, the more he was interested in it. So they brought over uh, Werner Glass and Barbara Glass and uh, Hans and Rosemary Gabert and Theo and Mariana Bergen, these, six, these three couples. And they started the school there, Waldorf School. Many years later, I came to that school and I, be, I knew all those people very, very, very well. And I knew Ralph very well because he was he wasn't like a father because Ralph was like a jovial friend. It wasn't someone that you really would consider a father, but he was certainly someone you'd want to take on any adventure or to go with you anywhere where you're going because he would make it light and beautiful and humorous and and point things out that you would not have noticed otherwise. And every time you met Ralph Marinelli, he had an active big thought in his head. I never once ever encountered Ralph where he didn't say, hey, hey, you got a minute? Uh, what do you think about this? And then he'd run an idea by, by me that was just so huge and so profound that I, I wouldn't even quite know how to respond, but I always did. One day, when the school where I was working as a class teacher in the Waldorf School came up not having a teacher to finish the sequence that the teachers taught from first through eighth grade. So a sixth grade teacher was leaving at the end of the year and we needed a teacher for seventh and eighth grade and we we couldn't think of anyone. There were no teachers around, blah, blah, blah. We needed it uh, immediately. It was at the last minute. And so I said, well, let's let's have Ralph Marinelli teach the class. And they all burst out laughing because Ralph was known almost as as a buffoon, as a comedian, as a, people didn't quite take him serious because they didn't take long enough to listen to what he had to say. But if they did, they would have known that we were dealing with a genius there. So eventually uh, I convinced them to hire him because I was one of the lead teachers in the school and I said, I will mentor him. So here's a guy, 30 years, my senior or more or something, and I'm a young punk upstart. And so I get to, I had already know, known Ralph very well. I was on the board of directors uh, as the secretary. He was, of course, on the board of directors for the school and for this teacher training institute called the Waldorf Institute. He was also one of the founders of the Waldorf Institute, which was where they trained Waldorf teachers to make sure to provide teachers for the Detroit Waldorf School. So he was connected to both. And he wasn't one of the three founders who did a lot of teaching they didn't ask him to do a lot of teaching, but when he did, it was astounding, and people were just amazed at what he would help them understand. But the other two directors were the ones who uh, led the institute. So anyway, Ralph agrees, amazingly, to take on teaching a class. Well, he's never done that. He, he's never taught children, and to teach a seventh and eighth grade is basically to give him a ticket to hell. Uh, anyway, Ralph came in, and he did the most stupendous job but not at, uh, without a lot of difficulties. He was so amazing because he was so good with engineering that in the seventh grade, you study Renaissance. So he built a self-standing scaffolding just like Michelangelo did in the Sistine Chapel. So you could lie on top of it, but there were no uh, structural supports coming from the ground up. There was no um, scaffolding. And the more weight you put on it, the more secure it became. So he could get all of the ch ch practically children in the class up there all at once, lying on their back, painting the ceiling so that they would have the same experience that, that uh, the painter of the Sistine Chapel did using the same engineering feat. And I don't even know of anyone who ever did that before. And that was after he uh, had built a Roman fountain for the children. So instead of just going to get a drink at the fountain, he turned it into a Roman beautiful mosaic uh, a fountain. And this is, every time he turned around, he'd do these amazing things with the students. So Ralph finished the eighth grade. And before, just before he finished the eighth grade, we're sitting and we're talking and he says, um, wow, I can't believe it. It's like, it's almost over. There's only one more thing to do and that's all set up. So I get to take a breath for the first time in years. And I said, yeah, isn't that great? Because he says, well, what am I gonna do with my time? I mean, I love Waldorf education. I mean, should I teach more classes? And I said, well, Ralph, I, I don't know. You're, you're kind of old and this one, the, this class almost killed you. So maybe, maybe you should reconsider that. So he's thinking, well, how can I help Waldorf education? How can I go the next step? I love Waldorf education. This is the most incredible experience of my life teaching these children. I'm saying, well, then you need to help Waldorf education. So at that moment, I had an intuition, and in those days I was very intuitive, and I had a clear and absolute intuition that Ralph would be the man who would discover or prove that the heart is not a pump. 
Now, that's significant, as I told him at that moment, when I said to him, you're going to prove what Rudolf Steiner told us to prove, that the heart is not a pump. And he looked at me and he said, I am? <laughs> I said, yes, you are. As a matter of fact, I'm so absolute certain of this that I'm going to put this X on your arm and I make an X on his arm and I'm going to hit it. And I'm going to hit it really, really hard because every time I see you after this graduation, I'm going to say, Ralph, have you proven that the heart is not a pump? And you're always honest. I've never known you to tell a lie. And, and so when you tell me you haven't, I'm going to put the X and punch you in your arm really hard. So the, the pain stays there for as long as I, I can make it stay there. Because why? I want you to realize this is, this is your mission in life. <laughs> now, he thought I was kidding at first. But after the you know first dozen times that I punched him in the arm, he started to get a clue that I was not kidding. And during that time, I told him, look, we have this group. We have a secret group. And at the end of this, I'll mention what this means. And the secret group's name is the fifth chamber. And that refers to the fifth chamber of the heart. And Rudolf Steiner said in our time, the secret of the fifth chamber would be revealed, as well as if we could discover that the human heart was not a pump, that we would actually fulfill a prophecy Steiner made. It wasn't really a prophecy, but he said, Rudolf Steiner said, roughly speaking, that if we could prove the heart was not a pump, then Waldorf education would be able to grow very quickly. And I was really into the whole national, international Waldorf movement, and I wanted to see it grow. And so I said, you know, this is what you're going to do because you're such a genius. You're such an incredible engineer. And now that you've studied students and you've had this experience of working with students in the Waldorf way, which awakens your what's called your ability to see the etheric formative forces, then, Ralph, I think you're ready. I think you'll be able to look at the heart, and I'm, I'm going to help you, my buddies in this group, and uh, hopefully we're going to be interviewing one of them, John Barnwell, here uh, very soon, so there'll be another audio you'll be able to listen to, and we'll interview another one who was involved with it at, at the end of the project, Rick Knutson, who was also a very good friend of Ralph Marinelli's, and we'll get their point of views from it, but my point of view was just very silly, and uh, but I was very serious. So Ralph got the picture. The fifth chamber group joined with him in his basement, and we started to study, I would call it more of esoteric. We studied what Rudolf Steiner said about the heart, which is some bizarre stuff. And we got that all down on paper, and we started mapping this out. And, and we, there are indications or things that Rudolf Steiner pointed at with his words, indications they're called, that are still the most mysterious things that I've ever come across in anything I've ever read anywhere, anyplace, anytime. Rudolf Steiner says, as again, I'll, I'll mention later, things about the white blood cell count in relationship to red blood cell, blood cell count. He talks about perception on the blood. He talks about the square inviolable part cube in the heart. He talks about the part of the heart that is so hot that it'll burn your finger. And he talks about all these things and you go, whoa, this is crazy talk. <laughs> this has seen nothing to do with the, this particular 3D world. The third dimension doesn't seem to work that way, Rudy Steiner. So we would sit around and we, we went back to ancient Indian texts. We studied the tattvas. We studied the ethers. We studied warmth, light, sound, life, and all of its manifestations in the ethers and the etheric formative forces. We studied what Steiner said about the etheric formative forces, what all of his students said about the ancient Indians and the Persians and everyone. So we studied everything. And we still didn't get very far. <laughs> I was there for the first year. And then I went off to Hawaii for five years. And when I came back, um, what had happened was they had taken all those amazing spiritual indications and kind of distilled them in a story. So Ralph and basically John Barnwell, they were the only two left standing out of the whole group that was around that giant table when we first started. So years later, when I came back, they had already written the article and John had his name on it. And he had actually named the article. Uh, it was called Verticordia, the goddess in reference to the Roman goddess who spins the heart. And so they were pointing out the hearts of vortex the uh, and all these different things, which John can address some of the technical ends. I know nothing about this. I just have my part of it. But before I left to go to Hawaii, a very uh, strange thing happened. 
Ralph called me down because I wasn't really part of the research where he would go over to the slaughterhouse near Wayne State University uh, Medical Research Center where he was working with cardiologists and all kinds of other doctors. And he was pointing things out to them because Ralph was convinced that phenomenologically, if you could awaken your sense perception, you'd be able to see these things because that was his experience in working with every broken thing that ever happened in the U.S. Army is just look at them. You have to look at them a new way. And you might have to fix them up. You might have to jerry-rig them, Rube Goldberg them, whatever. But in the end, if you understand the forces, because your sense of perception is enhanced, then you can get somewhere. So, and this is to demonstrate a point. And the point is, doctors, since forever, have been listening to the heart. And if you ask them what the heart sounds like, they'll say, well, it goes thump thump or lump drump. <laughs> There's funny little words they use for it. But when they're listening to your heart, a cardiologist is so good at his ears, with his ears and listening to the heart, that he can hear if there's valve problems. He can hear all kinds of things just listening. Well, we had gone to the, uh, Ralph had gone to the university and gotten the Doppler and MRI and all these complicated things uh, where you could see the, see the heart as it's beating and see the forces uh, both in a human being or he would bring over sheep hearts or, or cow hearts wrapped in wool because they would continue to beat for hours, sometimes days which was a bit shocking to people. Uh, and he would demonstrate this and they'd go, well, that can't be, that can't happen. No, 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 that can't happen. Well, yes, it did happen. So we were there and we were looking at this and then we were looking at some human hearts. And as we were listening to a human heart, I said, I started laughing. And I said, isn't that hysterical? All my life, I thought it went thump, thump. And they looked at me and they said, it does. And I said, no, it doesn't. Well, well, listen, you're kidding, right? Listen to it. Listen to it. It doesn't go thump, thump. It, it, well, first off, these were Doppler, which had sound to them, so you could hear the rush of the blood through the heart, which, which later, by the way, they proved goes much faster through the heart than anybody ever imagined. But anyway, I said, no, no, listen, listen. It goes swish, swish, swish. And they said, no, it doesn't. I said, yes, it does. Swish, swish, swish. And then we kept getting closer to the microphone. And here are, I don't know, maybe five doctors and Ralph. And I'm there going, uh, y'all, sharpen your ears. Incline your ear. It goes swish, swish, swish. The swish in the middle is real short. They're listening. They're listening. And then they all hear it all at once. And then they look at each other. And they're just blown away. They had never actually heard the heartbeat. Amazing. These are top doctors, research doctors who make their living listening to the heart, had never actually heard the heart. Now, this is to demonstrate that once a concept is put in your brain, you use that concept to overlay your percept. And when you don't do that, then that's called Gertianistic phenomenological observation. And so if you really, and that's what's happened with all the great, well, many, many of the great inventions were at a certain moment, someone working with something they'd been working with for years finally actually sees it or hears it or you know, really perceives what is going on. And that's what happened to that moment. And then they went, no, this can't be. And then they spooled out a tape after tape and they're listening to this and they're going, it's on every one. At first they thought, this is a sick person because we were listening to tape, Doppler, and, and fMRI, all kinds of fancy MRIs and all kinds of stuff all merged together. And so they pulled out tape after tape and they're listening to them because they'd been listening to this sheep heart. Uh, but they started listening to the human being and they saw every one of them had that. And then at that point, they realized, and I said, well, look, gentlemen, you know, I know nothing, but here, let me tell you how the heart works. <laughs> and then I told them what I'm going to tell you, uh, what am I going to tell you at the end of this tape? And I told them the simple kind of spiritual way that a person like myself who had uh, certain kind of what you'd call now psychic abilities or clairvoyant abilities, I could look at the heart and I could see these things and I could look at the human body and see things and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't know what they meant, but I could tell you what I saw or I could tell you what I heard uh, because sometimes spiritual perception is hearing and sometimes it's even physical. So you touch it and then you understand. But anyway, so I'm, I, and I think that's why Ralph called, in, called me in because he was kind of stuck and he didn't know where to go. And I'll describe uh, some of the places he went in a minute, but... Um, 
John Barnwell can describe it better, and Rick Knutson's an engineer, he can describe it very well. But in the end, he was kind of stuck. So when I went in there and with absolute beginner's mind, simply said, well, <laughs> Ralph, y'all haven't even learned to listen to the heart yet, first off. Now, I know nothing and I haven't been part of the research, uh, the technical research. Uh, so, you know, here's my opinion. And, and they all were like, you must be out of your mind. Well, many of those things have come to pass. And I don't know if it was because Ralph's research after a few years later got printed and then every good cardiologist all said that they all kind of knew that that was the way that it worked when they really didn't, but they're doctors, so they have to be godlike, you know, omniscient, so they have to act like they knew all along. But anyway, other things that were pointed out through our spiritual research have now come to pass to be understood as common science. But guess what? They will not appear in the science books, especially in any for a child, or but if you look it up on the internet and you look at the the, the modern most current research, some of the things I'm going to tell you that are that are spiritual have now been proven, beyond a shadow of a doubt in multiple multiple ways. So, Ralph and John continue to work in the basement. People dropped in some doctors, some uh, his son who was a uh, um, he was a doctor who worked on the, pul um, what is it? The lung system's called pulmonary, I believe. But anyway, he worked on lungs. And of course, the lungs are connected to the heart. So he was very interested in his dad's research, but he was a doctor and he had to make a living at it. But when Ralph finally got it together and demonstrated these things with machines, because that's what the doctors need to believe it is a machine has to tell them what they believe now is scientific materialistic proof. Well, the machine says, and so he had the Doppler. So when the machine didn't lie and it showed there were three vortices and then they couldn't find the vor vortex. And so sometime later I came back there again and Ralph said, well, I want to show you the fantastic advances we've made. And so he went in and he showed me this stuff and I said, well, have you located the three vortices? And he goes, well, no, I haven't done that yet. But I did da 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 he, he proved that the bottom of the heart that the tissue is too thin to actually be a pump. That in itself proved it for most doctors. They went, whoa, why didn't we think of that? Of course, the sides thicken, but the bottom uh, of, the, of the heart does not thicken and it's the thinnest part of the heart. So why doesn't it explode? Uh, so simple things that he pointed out that were simple mechanical engineering phenomena. Uh, even the way that the blood flows, Ralph was able to show. Now, let's go to how it was that John and Ralph discovered these things. First off, Victor Schauberg was a scientist who was really not a scientist. He used his powers of observation to create all kinds of inventions, but he really was not a scientist. But he believed, and what, let me just point out the way that it kind of started. He looked at the research, well, it wasn't even research, he looked at the fact that when you cut down trees and you send them through a flute or a sluice, in other words, a little channel, uh, and you run water through it, then you could take the logs cut up on top of a hill and you can run them down the hill very easily, as long as you had the water running down the hill. Well, if they come to any slow place or it gets slowed down, then they start to say, well, what, you know, how could we improve this? Uh, well, he looked at the way, Victor Schauberg, looked at the way that fish would jump out of the water. And he demonstrated that they'd taken water through their gills and shoot it out, creating a, what you'd call a kind of a sack around their body that would then create a pressure that would cause them to be able to leap out of the water very high when in fact there shouldn't be any reason they should be able to leap that high. And so there's scales made for this to happen, but once the air and the water, so that the way the scales are cut, and then the way that the water ran through the gills and then was forced around the body of the fish created a slick surface that would then literally reduce friction so that it could leap out of the body, leap out of the water just higher than they should be able to. So he used this in these log flutes and he was able to run logs uphill, water uphill. But he found that it had to be in shade if it was going to go uphill, that they had to cut these scales into the sides of the channels where the logs were running, and that 
the temperature differential between the air and the water, and if there was shade, would determine whether his fluting would work. And it worked, and it became very common, and it was used for a long time, and most people don't understand how it even works. Well, he started to work with the pressures created by water. He actually created engines that could run on water and many, many, many other things. So they started working with Victor Schauberger's work, as well as the work of Theodore Schenck, who was an anthroposophist, and um, what is called kinematics, Hans Jenny, and they started working with flow because they couldn't figure out the heart. Why could they? Because Rudolf Steiner's indications do not tell you how to figure it out. He just tells you the way that it is, and then you got to figure it out, if, especially if you want to be an engineer and reverse engineer it and come up with understanding these fluid dynamics uh, systems. So Ralph started looking at this, and he found that all blood spirals and that these fluting kind of things down the side of a fish is the same kind of thing happens in your veins and arteries. And that's what reduces the pressure of the flow and the blood circulation. So they started working with this and they started working with vortex, uh, vortices, vortexes, and uh, toroidal fields and all these different things and the electric charge in the heart, which most people don't understand. There's an electrical charge in the heart that's 5,000 times, 50,000 times greater than the electric charge of the brain, some say, and 5,000 times more magnetic. So eventually now in modern world, they can measure the potential gradient coming off the heart. Of course, we know the Hertz frequency coming off the heart, plus we know the uh, bio, uh, biological frequency coming off the heart. And so you can work with all of these things, and, and Ralph and John worked with them. We even looked into things like the Betar machine, which is a transduction uh, direct current into uh, the body. And so if you take 7.83, the frequency of the heart electronically, uh, electrically, excuse me, and you put it into the body through the back, then your heart actually comes into balance for a while. So people who are, have addictions and people who are drug addicts have trans uh, have electrical transduction to the body using the frequencies of the different energy centers or, or nerve ganglia, what in the, e in the East they called chakras. So they worked on all of those things. They figured out all of that, but that wasn't the issue. The issue is why isn't the heart a pump? Well, the reason that they thought it was a pump is in the past, they would simply cut somebody and what would happen? The heart, the blood would squirt out, squirt, squirt, squirt. Oh, there it is, proof the heart's a pump. No, that's not really what's going on. So in the end, they demonstrated this. The heart is not a pump and they theorized that it is a um, series of vortices creating biological momentum in blood circulation as a ram, as a water ram works, it actually stops blood circulation for a moment, builds a charge from that. That charge then shoots through the heart, and this is now very well known, electrical charge shoots through the heart, and that causes the contractions and expansions of the heart. But also, Ralph went back and looked at the evolution of the heart. And if you look at the evolution of the heart, you see that the human heart goes through stages in the first 60 days, uh, as an embryo, where all the, the heart is one of the first things to form. And it goes through all the stages from worm to, to high-level mammal, warm-blooded uh, animals, mammals to us. So you see the entire evolution of the heart. So by the second month, the heart is beating. But it's not beating because of the heart being a strong muscle, because as you know, it keeps growing and it's only tiny. It beats because the circulation of the blood causes it to beat. Now that gets very complicated, but that's where I need to go with this because in the end, Ralph and John gave the project over, even changed the name, and it went into technical papers, three technical papers. I'd read the names of them, but they are um, in the very article that is in the video that's going to also be on this page. So when you look at that video, that 46-minute video, you're going to see an article, and that article is Ralph's first technical paper, which had five other doctors' names on it. John's name wasn't on it at that point. They weren't going to stick somebody on it, except they, they didn't want to put Ralph's name on it because he wasn't a doctor, a medical doctor, and they, they, they thought would, they would taint it. But eventually, it went into all circles of scientific uh, magazines, medical magazines, and everybody now accepts that the heart is not a pump. And then it set scientists to work like crazy, and they started noticing all the things about the heart that they'd never noticed because they were awakened to do this Gertianistic phenomenological observation of the heart. 
And then they started noticing the electrical potentials of the heart. They started noticing that the heart has to be in rhythm with the electrical potential of the brain. And if it's not in rhythm, then this is a problem. They noticed that the heart has to be linked to the kidneys. And as John had pointed out, he was the one who first pointed out, the heart is a system called the heart and reins. And the reins, like the reins in a horse, those are kidneys. So the heart can't really function properly without the pressure of the kidneys. So these things started to be looked at as systems, but Steiner gave many, many, many indications to anthroposophical doctors about these things and about the, uh, the, the circulatory system, the blood system, and many, many enigmatic occult physiological references or what's called esoteric anatomy or occult anatomy or esoteric physiology. He gave all these indications that we have yet to, uh, to unfold We've only began to touch on it when the heart was proven not to be a pump because then that opened up science in every other area uh, of thinking because it broke the mold of materialistic science because it basically said, look, you think you know so much? You think you've been observing this? You've observed improperly. Go back and observe again. And that's what Ralph's thing was all about, direct observation. So when he would give a presentation on these things, he would have you dying with laughter at the absurdities of the theories of scientists because they're just stupid. One of the ones that he would always, uh, he loved to use is he'd take this book, a science book, the highest level science book, modern science book, and it says, walking. Why does walking happen? Walking happens because you fall forward and then you just keep up. <laughs> so Ralph would take the book and he would lean as far backward as he could. <laughs> hold the book up real high and walk forward, though leaning backward, demonstrating that walking has nothing to do with falling forward and keeping up. So he would go ex example after example after example until he would soften your brain up from its old hard forms of concepts that then apply those concepts like boxes. You put concepts in boxes and then you take them out. And when you look at a tree, you apply your own understanding, your own concept to that tree. You're not even looking at the tree. Most of the time, we don't even observe things. We simply apply what we think they're going to be so we can get meaning out of perception. Well, Steiner pointed out, perception goes into the blood and it literally becomes sulfur, salt, and mercury. And we can, I can go into all those things, but I'll save that for maybe, I'll see what Rick and John have to say. And then at the end, I'll add my own thing about the deep, deep esoteric side of what you need to understand about the heart. But I will tell you this, the heart is the same thing as the entire universe. And throughout the entire universe, the Schumann wave, 7.83, the frequency of the heart, can penetrate any substance. It goes right through the earth. It goes through metal. Nothing stops it. This is the vibration of the universe. That is the vibration of, the, of your heart. Not the thump thump, but the vibration of your heart. And that vibration is the cosmic vibration of the universe. And so it, it, your consciousness is in the heart. And this is what we always tried to get at. We tried to get Ralph and all those doctors to become spiritual and awaken their sense of perception so that they could see spirit manifesting as it dies into matter. And that's really what does happen. But we don't know that. And so you see the shadow of spirit and then you think the shadow is it. But the shadow's dead. So most, of, most materialistic scientific concepts have to do with entropy, just like all of astrophysics, all based upon entropy. So the human heart is the key to everything. Now, we can go into that and we'll do a separate tape on that. But Ralph Marinelli understood that because he had one of the biggest and openest, widest, giganticest, superest heart I've ever seen in my life. He never met someone he didn't love and that he interacted with them in such a genuine, beautiful way that they didn't know it, but they were being healed just by talking to him. And so it was uh, a fluke, you know, that I was actually connected to this and that I was the person who kept punching him in the arm to say, you know, I'm going to keep punching you until you do what Steiner told us to do. And we, I, when I say us, I mean you, you, Ralph, have to do this. And I knew he could do it, but he just needed a little bit of coaxing. And so uh, the, the fifth members of the fifth chamber and many other people worked with him. But as I say, at the moment that it became very obvious that his research was 100% provable, then everyone jumped aboard. And now it is unbelievable. One of the doctors that jumped on board, and I'm not even going to say his name, but I know him and I went to a conference with where he was one of the keynote speakers not long ago, and he never mentioned Ralph Marinelli's name.
I was so insulted. This is a person who came in late to the game, got all the credit, has now written a book, and basically he did do one fantastic thing, and I'm going to mention that. And so it wasn't that he stole Ralph's work because he took it further, because they now have much more research. The pressures involved in capillary dynamics are so profound that no one ever knew this until Ralph pointed this out. Because you can have a blood cell, it's every single blood cell moves in the same way and is basically a heart. And it's an energized, magnetic, electrical, living being creating chemical exchanges that actually turn the heart into what you call a plasma generator, a cold plasma generator, but not that cold, you know, body warmth. So what was then proven was that since the capillary dynamics are so profound that even a blood corpuscle can't go through how small the capillary dynamics is, there's a fantastic suction that happens on the outside of your body when the capillary dynamics gets so small or in any part of your body going into organs, it gets so small that as red blood taking oxygen depletes it and takes on carbon dioxide, that carbon dioxide is sucked back to the heart. So in fact, not only is the heart in one point sucking and then pumping or expressing, but not as a pump, but as a vortex, as a uh, vortex uh, momentum booster, but, and in a spiraling fashion, but also what we call the ether, and the ether extending all the way out, the ethers out to the uh, skin, basically the outer extreme of the body, sucks the blood out, and then the heart sucks it back. And so what is it that's sucking it out? It needs nourishment. It's crying for hunger. So as the red blood goes out, it's actually being called for. It's almost like the whole body is drawing it out. And then when it receives what it wants and it's then filled with poison, carbon dioxide, it basically spits it back and the heart then becomes like a ram pump. It sucks it back down, comes into a still spot, creates a vacuum, fills it, and then uses the force of that, that it used to come into the heart or a ram pump as the same force to send it out in a spiraling fashion. And so this is what Ralph also demonstrated, but no one had ever demonstrated it medically. And now this doctor who came in late to his research has demonstrated this. And now again, the normal medical phenomena, all doctors in the world act like they knew this to begin with. But anyway, I was privileged to know Ralph Marinelli, incredibly privileged, and I was incredibly privileged to be given the intuition that he was the man who would discover this. And basically, that was really my only part. I'd only shared, you know, the research that I'd done, but my research didn't lead anywhere except to try to uh, help Ralph and help John Barnwell and the others who work with them and all the doctors now have that have their name on this research and other further research because the human heart is not a machine and the brain is not a computer. And we need to stop using these physical analogies that basically lead to a horrifying type of materialism where the human body is not considered the sacred temple that it is. And so this is what I'll be talking about in the, in the next uh, audio, but we also will be bringing you a conversation with John Barnwell and perhaps in the future a conversation with Rick Knutson and maybe others who were involved in the process. So remember, thank you Ralph Marinelli for proving that the heart is not a pump and for advancing Waldorf education throughout the whole world. This was your wish, this was your desire, and we thank you for your tremendous work.